How much trouble are we in if Brexit goes ahead next March? It could be a car crash, uh, but I hope not. I mean, the whole point is, as we uh, had this amazing result to the referendum, which nobody on either side saw coming, so nobody had really thought through what this meant for our place in the world, our relations with Europe, but everybody else, if we're about to make this uh, great change compared with the previous 50 years. Uh, and now there's a great debate broken out about every detail of it. Uh, we, we, what we have to do is minimise the damage, because I do think we've weakened ourselves politically and economically, actually put in place new arrangements which fit the modern world and fit our interests in the modern world. There are many people who are opposed to leaving the European Union who are really tearing their hair out, who I have sleepless them. nights, mm. get very, very worried about it, get very, very wound up about it. I mean, you've always struck me as a man who, who doesn't have sleepless nights about anything. <laughs> if, if there's anything that would keep you awake, would it be this? Uh, if anything, if there was anything, it would. Yes, it would be this. But I've hardly lost ever night's sleep. I do occasionally find myself things throughout my career. That I, the reason I've lasted so long, I think, when most of my friends and contemporaries are, are now out of politics altogether or they've gone to the House of Lords or something. Um, I, I'm so laid back as to be almost horizontal. Uh, I mean, I, I just don't get stressed. Uh, and the result is I get very you know, stuck into these things. I get very passionate about them. Uh, but it doesn't actually have a daily effect on me. Now, I meet many, many angry Remainers. It's the first time in my life I have people coming up to me in the street who I don't know, urging me to continue, usually, because it's normally supporters who approach you. The, ones who strongly disagree with you politely walk past. But, um, yeah, no, it, 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 I just am concerned in a political way. I think we are taking huge decisions which will affect the lives of the next generation or two in a very big way, and we're taking them in a slightly crazy way. I mean, it's an extraordinarily frenzied debate to take part in. I mean, people often say, is this the worst government in living memory. Well, they often say that about other governments, yeah. <laughs> I mean, where, where do you place this lot? Well, this is, I think, Theresa May has inherited the worst problems uh, that I can think for any prime minister in my lifetime. Uh, it's going to be made worse by the inconclusive result of the election. You have uh, both parties hopelessly split. Uh, you have a government that is incapable so far of agreeing even at cabinet level about their, their policy on most basic things. Uh, you have an opposition party also completely split, full range of opinions, uh, in an odd situation because it's led by someone who's not remotely representative of the parliamentary MPs behind him uh, and who himself is a hardline Brexiteer, which is not the position of most Labour MPs or most uh, Labour voters. Uh, and we, we try to con conduct all this in the traditional way against the background of a, a referendum. And referendums are designed to eliminate Parliament and the political class out of decisions. They're meant to be you know, putting a firm control on all this. So it's slightly impotent Parliament. It, although most MPs were Remainers, they feel obliged to follow the referendum result. And, well, I won't go on. Uh, that does create the oddest situation I've ever seen, but it's taking us far too long to come out of this chaotic state. We're still in the chaotic stage. So if by some miracle um, everything changed and you were suddenly delivered into number 10 and told, um, Ken, we need you to take over and lead us <laughs> out of this mess, what would you do? I'd say I was too old for that. <laughs> no, but, uh, what, would, what would I do? Uh, well, I, I, I would actually... Oh, good grief. Uh, given that it wouldn't start from here, I, I would try to get a cabinet which I thought was capable of agreeing, but still represented as wide a body of opinion as I could within my party. And I would really insist we moved promptly to uh, having full argumentative debate, no doubt, but agreeing a policy we were all going to stick to and be collectively responsible for. I mean, it sounds very corny, but that's but, but the way... But would you Brexit, or would you... Would you, would you lead the country and the, and the cabinet to stopping it? I'm resigned to the fact that the political class are never are not going to reverse this, not the present ones. I'm more pessimistic about But you're resigned that. to that rather than thinking... Well, it's the right I'm pessimistic about it. I know there are some very leading Remainers who are confident they're going to get this reversed, either in Parliament or there's all this great campaign to hold a second referendum. My, my, I rather wince at that. I mean, 
And one referendum is bad enough, thank you very much. I mean, they're a crazy way of deciding things. It'd be a pure gamble if we had a second referendum. But anyway, leaving that aside, the, the reality is that I think everybody's doomed to just let us leave. In fact, we're about to leave less than a year's time. So more urgently than ever need to concentrate on what are we going to do to minimize the damage. In the moment, what we're concentrating on is avoid new barriers to trade and investment, which will uh, make us much poorer than we otherwise be. And then what are we going to do about all the other things which we actually have in the past done by cooperating closely with the rest of Europe, which is the sensible way of doing it but you say in the we're modern globe. I mean, I know, I say I know you're being a... I say we're doomed to leave. I mean, that's what the referendum decided, and there are very few politicians who will have the nerve to try to reverse that. But, I mean, I know you're being a political realist, uh, well, but that's what, what would you like... Well, I think I am, yeah. What would you like to do if you could do whatever... You, if you could change the world... Well, if I was suddenly what, what well, I be? would not want to see in this country someone trying to be a benign dictator, I, I would be opposed to anybody who wanted to be a benign dictator. Everybody knows my, 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 my I mean, I've got... You'd stop. All I'm doing is I'm sticking, sticking to the views that have guided me for the last 50 years, and the ones I formed when I was a student, make me join the... I was a conservative, I'm a natural conservative, uh, and those include... Uh, an internationalist approach to world affairs, uh, and a belief in the European project. I think we make ourselves a much more powerful and influential voice in today's world as a leading member of the European Union, and we create a modern competitive economy by being in what was first the common market, the customs union, but actually the Thatcher government's main creation, which is the single market. You said you wanted to go into politics from being a boy? Yeah, sure. Why did you decide you wanted to I don't be know. a politician? Never able to answer that question. I just got fascinated by it as a primary school boy uh, reading my father's newspaper, which was the Daily Mail, actually. Uh, and I used to read the other bit. I wasn't as... I don't think I was a weird little boy. Uh, I did uh, read the sports pages, and I did, uh, you know, read the cartoon called Fluke and things. But then I, I followed very closely, as a very small boy, uh, the, the politics of the Attlee government. I mean, I know it makes me sound old as Methuselah, but I was in short trousers. But I was actually quite... I'm, I'm sure I didn't understand it. I mean, I'm, Lord knows what views, if any, I had. Uh, but I followed it as a kind of soap opera, you know, the, 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 what was happening. Do so you remember the start of the NHS and all of that? Is that I, I dimly remember that. I remember Stafford Cripps rather more clearly, who was the iron austerity chancellor who, uh, who was portrayed as this sort of fierce academic man, because he'd been very left-wing, but he was a very, very fiscally severe chancellor, as he had to be. The country was broke after the Second World War. Uh, and, um, yes, I, I remember rationing. I remember the Korean War. I mean, you know, you know, I, mean I don't normally freely reminisce like this. It's only a different sort of program. But did it you reveals talk to people about these things, or were these things that you just thought about yourself? Not often. I kept I mean, a scrapbook of either the 1950 or the 1951 election, which I unfortunately lost. Uh, I remember telling my... When I was called before the class with one or two others to say what we wanted to be when we left school, I said I wanted to be an MP, to the amazement of my uh, school teacher, I have no doubt. Um, no, there, were, there weren't other boys to be to gossip with. I, mean, I started, obviously, later as my secondary school. Politics occasionally came up in the conversation. By that time, I, I was still getting even more clear that I really did want to get involved. Because this, this was not your world, was it? I mean, you didn't no, know. No, I had uh, or... I had a communist grandfather, but uh, uh, who, but he was the kind of pre-war idealistic communist pacifist thought Uncle Joe Stalin was running a kind of worker's paradise out there in, 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 in the Soviet Union. Um, was and it a Labour family, generally, then? Or? Uh, I, mean, I think it was. I mean, it was... But I think, actually, after the war, my father became a shopkeeper. He sort of... Uh, uh, and I think he became a Tory, as he went along. I don't know my mother ever did. So were you a Tory as a boy, then? I went to university and joined all the parties in order to get involved, uh, and... Did, not decide. The sarcastic way I usually put it is that I was trying to decide which was going to have the privilege of having me as a member. By the end of my first year as King Conservative, I was attracted by the, I, I mean, what I regarded as the modernizing Conservatives. The Labour Party uh, by that stage 
was had got two set already in the post-world Attlee trade union dominated co-op movement dominated world uh, and and the country was actually a bit of a political joke and the economy was being left behind by the countries we've beaten in the war and I think what really decided as far as which sort of conservatives I followed was Suez that was Anthony Eden's last folly of the great imperialist protecting our route to India all this kind of thing not understanding that Britain's role in the world had rather substantially changed and it was a fiasco and so when Macmillan applied to join the European community and, and, and to actually get involved in the way the modern world was evolving, that was actually one of the main things that made me a, a very active conservative by my last few years at university. So you, you, you know, as a young boy and as a student, you then wanted to be an MP and you were pursuing that. Were you doing that because you wanted to change the world or Britain or because you wanted power or, you know, what was it that you were seeking? Well, no, no one ever knows. I don't, I don't think it was just naked ambition and I don't think I am, a, you know, I don't think megalomania has hit me too badly. Um, so the, the attractiveness of power, you know, hasn't well, carried me away. Well, power for huge amounts of I power. have, actually, but I've always told myself it is transient, you know, when when we were living in Downing Street, so my wife and I always used to tell each other, of course, remember all, what's going to happen is you're going to be an ex-chance of the Exchequer sooner or later. Don't get carried away by it. Um, no, no, I, did, I think it was, to use the Corley or phrase, I, I was so interested in these things and I thought we could make a difference. I actually did think that free market economics combined with a social conscience, internationalism, coming to terms with a world that was already changing, but a different world to the one we were trying to live in. Uh, you know, I, I, I wished to contribute to that in order to make my living I, I, I went off to be a lawyer, but I always combined that with being an active politician and eventually had to give my practice up when I got really immersed in a long spell as a minister. I mean, now, of course, you're known as the man who speaks his mind and nobody really tries to always change it. Bit, and, <laughs> um, you know, no one's ever going to change Ken Clark's mind on Europe and all the rest of it. He'll vote however he wants. But presumably, as a young politician, you did have to toe the party line. Well, I, I approve of the party political system. And no, no, I made the usual... You have, you have to have compromise. Made the usual compromises. Uh, the, the, as you say, and I think I always, at the same time, uh, made it quite clear. People did know I was a man of firm opinions. I'm slightly combative sometimes. And uh, I was a very controversial minister, most of the jobs I had. And they were, they were very much implementing policies that I wanted to implement and wanted to argue about and explain why and defend myself against my critics. So within the rules, uh, I think I always had this reputation of being very forthright. But did uh, you with vote for things you didn't agree with? Uh, not often, no. For example, I was still in the cabinet. David had got me back when he had this crazy idea of calling this referendum. And I was in the cabinet, and I read about it in the newspaper. He had no cabinet discussion. I mean, cabinet government, as I recall, started coming to an end with Tony Blair onwards, I think, but Cameron and Theresa, I think, don't really run a cabinet pro in the way we used to. So I was extremely angry and went and had an argument with him. When the vote came up, I didn't vote for it. I didn't vote against it, I have to admit. As a gesture to collective responsibility, I abstained. And my colleagues and the whips all pretended not to notice. So there wasn't a crisis about it, it was a, but uh, for my own satisfaction. Uh, and and I, on previous occasions, I, I had not voted for things which I thought were a mistake. But that, that didn't put you off politics, is what I mean. You know, the, the inherent compromises of being a no, party uh, politician. Uh, like, well, I believe in real government. To say, if you're trying to make a difference, there's no point thinking you're just going to be an anarchic man on a soapbox sounding off to it. I mean, that's more pleasing yourself than it is trying to make a difference. No, I, uh, until, until recently, until I never had any problem. I was a mainstream conservative. Now I'm regarded as this, you know, outspoken, pro-European, keeps voting against the government. What I'm voting for have been the policies of the Conservative Party throughout my life, all the way through the referendum campaign until the extraordinary result and my lifelong beliefs. And, I, and I'm not joining in in all this childlike, crazy briefing against each other and gossiping and 
exchanging personal insults. I, I'm silent on that. That's a silly waste of time. Uh, but I do make speeches and I do vote on the basis that uh, it is really crazy to start now taking the idea of leaving the EU to the extent of doing serious damage to our economy, to our security, and so on. I mean, do you feel the Conservative Party has left you, if you like, I mean, changed massively? No, I think the bulk of, uh, the, the great bulk of Conservative MPs, the majority of the House of Commons, but the majority in both large parties, but let's stick to the Conservative Party, the, the, the majority of backbenchers and the majority of ministers, both in the Cabinet and certainly if you take all the junior ministers in, uh, they're moderate and pragmatic about what to do uh, now we have to leave. I'm not sure the Prime Minister is that far, in her personal views, from me, but she's very cagey about it. Uh, she has to be. She's trying to lead a very divided party. Um, so, no, no, I don't regard myself as being strident and outspoken, and I actually think there was a kind of silent majority in the House of Commons which largely agrees with me. And, and let, until this referendum was held, there wasn't the slightest prospect of any British Parliament under any government ever deciding to leave the European Union. Do, do you think the election laws matter? I mean, it now appears that the Electoral Commission thinks the Vote Leave campaign broke the rules on spending, funneled money into this smaller group, Believe, um, and, and broke the law. Um, you know, does that delegitimise the campaign and the vote at all for you? Well, firstly, I think electoral law matters a lot. Uh, and if you look at the dreadful state of American politics, uh, all sorts of things gone wrong there. But, but one is that money has now overwhelmed everything. You know, practically everybody elected has, has to become a spokesman for some lobby or other, because it costs so much to campaign that you have to raise millions of dollars, which only a, a few people can raise in more ordinary ways. And, and, and it, the money and the misuse of money on negative campaigning, all this kind of thing, there does have to be. Uh, we, we've kept our process just about intact by having all these rules on spending limits and, and all the rest of it. Uh, so they do matter. Um, and we get more and more strange people coming into politics and spending a lot of money just to pursue their own personal enthusiasms. Uh, whether it, we can really say that that affected the result, uh, that it wouldn't have gone that way if it hadn't been for the Russians or if it hadn't been for all this money being poured at it, I'm not so sure. Because the referendum, the reason it went the way it was, was not about anything specifically European, I think. But what, what, what we found was an angry, protesting feeling like sections of the electorate. I mean, the political public, sensible people on both sides, you know, probably 30% of the population one way, 30% the other, had intelligent, sensible reasons for being Remainers or Leavers. But on top of that, there was this angry, anti-politician, anti-establishment vote. People who thought the world was changing too much were disappointed by either their living standards or, or the role they found in the world. Exactly the vote that produced Trump in America produced Brexit in the United Kingdom. Now, whether more strict enforcement of the electoral rules would have changed that, I'm not sure. There's a, there is a fundamental underlying problem, which I don't think anybody yet knows exactly how, how to uh, uh, redress. It's going to take a long time to realize that we've, we've got to face up to this fact. We have a lot of bitter, disappointed, angry people who treat all, politi all real politicians and the political establishment with disdain. The idea that the Electoral Commission reverse the referendum and scrap it and null it, so you've got to rerun it because of what were appear fairly plainly to have been the financial irregularities in the Leave campaigning, that would be a big step. I mean, the, world, the life's... Well, world's so, wrong. Yeah, well, the political world's so mad and crazy at the moment. I mean, anybody who predicts what's going to happen from one week to the other gets taken by surprise. It gets ever zanier as it goes on. But I've, I've never... There's, there's been no amendment in Parliament. There's been no debate I've taken part in, no vote I've cast, which has tried 
to reverse the result of the referendum. It seems to me a done deal. Uh, we had the referendum two years ago. We have invoked Article 50, and we're on the point of implementing it. We're going to leave in March next year. It could be deferred for a short time, but, I mean, we are leaving. I mean, did you feel... Did, did that make you examine your own record and your own behaviour? Yes, a bit. I mean, I, I was, I'm part of the 1990s establishment, really. I think the 1980s and 1990s were a very good period, internationally and nationally. Uh, we were making progress. An international rules-based order, the end of the Cold War, collapse of the Berlin Wall. Economically, we were developing a globalised economy. All kinds of previously poor countries were emerging. World poverty was halved in that time. We had free markets with a social conscience. We thought we knew how to run it, how to manage it, monetary policy, fiscal policy. Uh, those were great days. And we did rather, as the GDP grew and governments could spend more money and the living standards of the successful rose, we all thought this is fine. With hindsight, we didn't realize that rather a high proportion of the population were being left behind, that rapid change was closing the foundries, the coal mines, the skilled, the skilled jobs that they were proud of had gone, uh, and that the, the elderly prosperous, the rural shire Tories, felt everything was changing too fast, that too many foreigners coming. Uh, they didn't welcome and accept multiculturalism, multi-ethnicity, multinational capitals like in the cities, particularly London and all that. It, it worried them there were people talking foreign languages on the bus. A, a, and people like me, I think, until the referendum, did not really cotton on to how deep this was going. I knew that the political class was being increasingly despised, but I thought that was modern public relations techniques and this silly sloganizing and the general trivializing of debate that's gone on. But you think but they're we, wrong. We missed a basic point. I mean, isn't the trouble that you, you, you really, in your heart of hearts, you think the people who despise you are wrong about and all no, of no, those no, I think, first of you, we, we did fail to react. We, we, I think we failed to ensure that the uh, benefits of rapid economic growth were shared widely. Looking back, you know, there were rather over-publicized super-rich who did far too well. We really, particularly in America, but then it started happening here, didn't do anything when the ordinary, the living standards of the ordinary population stopped rising. And the share of what benefits were all going to the successful, the prosperous, and all that kind of so thing. So what should we, yeah, we did, we, and then On immigration, whilst on, this country has benefited from immigration, in my view, very many ways. But there is illegal immigration. There are people pouring in on the back of lorries and so on. It would be very nice to take all these poor young men from Africa who are coming here because they've seen on television they can get a better life. But the, I'm afraid the honest truth is that that we can't take them at this pace, and we're not controlling it at the moment, but we've got to find some way of controlling the flow, all those things. Looking back, I think we, the establishment, I hope not, you know, but I must take some of the share of blame, we were a bit too establishment. We thought we'd achieved economic success, uh, and so everybody would eventually be happier, and it all be all right. Uh, of course, then, I also think, a bit of day-to-day -day politics, pig's ear was made, allowing greedy bankers to run rings around useless regulators. And then we had a dreadful financial crash, first since 1930, well, since in the 30s, uh, which caused awful effects, including in Britain, the longest, deepest recession since the war. Now, we've never recovered politically or economically with that. That brought out all these angry feelings. But are you saying that, in retrospect, we should have had a more activist economic policy, that we should have redistributed wealth we, we, more, we, we, should have, we had, should have had governments propping up business more? No, no, i no, not, not go back to the awful 1960s where you, you know, you subsidised all the uncompetitive but politically sensitive businesses and so on, start buying cars. Well, then how as government yeah. would you have made uh, uh, Britain fair? Yeah, well, actually, do, do something to actually stop the excesses of corporate pay. If shareholder democracy won't do it, you've got to have some restraints on these crazy executive pay levels, which began to break out in the 2000s and have been mad ever since. Uh, they actually have some of the things we're now trying, about 
ensuring that proper regard was had to the relationship between the pay at the top and the pay of those working at the heart of the company or business, whatever it happens to be, and so on. The minimum wage we finally started picking up on. I, I opposed that at first. I was wrong about that. But it's not just the minimum wage. It's other ways in which you can try to ensure the benefits are more widely uh, spread. Uh, but you do have to reassure people that the people coming in are legal and coming here in circumstances where they're going to contribute to our economy or they have some compelling, long-standing reason for fleeing persecution politically or religious persecution, which we've always accepted in this country. And we're going to handle it in such a way that they take a proper role in our society, that you can't enforce integration, but that you encourage integration and make sure strains and social differences don't occur. I mean, it's rare and that, that would have made a big difference. A, a politician acknowledging that there is, you know, a lot of racism and xenophobia around. Not, I didn't say a lot. I think it's, I think we're probably better than most European countries, that it's, the r real racists are a small minority, you know, the British... Well, how small? I mean... Well, what, what did the British National Party used to poll? About six or seven percent, and it all went into UKIP eventually. But, but UKIP wasn't all racialist. The UKIP campaigning did sometimes get very near dog whistle racism. I don't accuse them of uh, being racist. Some of their voters were. But, but our right-wing parties used to be uh, ex that, that kind of extreme right-wing were a pretty tiny fringe. And I just think in day-to-day -day life in Britain, I think the British are extremely tolerant, very relaxed, and actually the younger generation under the age of 50 perfectly well integrated, most of them, uh, apart from the young ones who've got some sort of, sort of grievance and are embittered in some way. Because again, in all the Western democracies, there's a tendency, if you feel inadequate and you're failing in some way, you need to blame a scapegoat. Uh, and they're the sort of people who join these dotty uh, fringe parties, which have ne never really in, taken off him. In the Conservatives? No, no, I'm sure there are people who in the Conservative Party who have um, pleasant views, but they're, 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 I mean, they're not, they're in, any, not in any prominent position. Uh, we, you, sometimes you, uh, must be, I'm sure we have the odd members. I know uh, Saida is demanding an inquiry into Islamophobia, but I have a lot of time for Saida. She's a friend of mine, but I, 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 I think she's being too sensitive. But that, there are some far more elderly, crusty, right-wing people in the Conservative Party than there used to be, but there have always been some in the party. But Islamophobia, individual examples, probably, and we should get rid of the people who obviously have some silly prejudice, but no, not in the Conservative Party generally. Where do you, I mean, it's a bit of an odd question to ask somebody of your generation this, but what, what do you think of all those people who are going around saying, Look, Brexit was delivered by an aging generation. They're dying out. Young people don't want this, um, you know, and they've, they've they've condemned the younger generation. And we should, you know, they shouldn't have really had a say if you if you were over <laughs> seventy. I've never heard anybody say that. <laughs> I mean, it's true to a certain extent. I wouldn't put it like that. Uh, I mean, I've ne we've never had anything which divided the generations. I'm quite un I'm obviously untypical of my generation. Majority of people my age were quite heavily. Uh, uh, Brexiteer, uh, and the majority of people, I think the turning point was over the age of 50, uh, under that age, were increasingly heavily pro-European. So uh, I, I, I think that's because attitudes of the younger people have adjusted to the modern world. It, it, it's not odd to them to hear foreign language on the bus. Uh, they know that big international companies employ people of every nationality, and they uh, they, they go to schools where they have friends whose backgrounds, uh, you know, their parents are all over the place. So do you think the Brexit majority will have died out by the time we Brexit? <laughs> yes, but who knows what the young people would have ever been to. I, the, the Brexit, I mean, my generation included all the people like me who were great enthusiasts for the European project. Today's anti, you know, the modern world uh, uh, Brexiteers they start to emerge in the early 1980s, coinciding with our newspapers being bought by various people who, for personal reasons, were fanatically against the European Union, Conrad Black and uh, Rupert Murdoch, uh, and so on. So there were campaigning vehicles suddenly for all this. And it's, it's a modern phenomenon. Now, whether today's young people who are internationalist 
uh, become, as they get older, uh, nationalist and isolationist and all the rest of it? I don't know. What I'd like to see is a reasonable outcome to today's debate so we just stop having this overheated, lightweight, rather neurotic, sometimes quite offensive exchange of views which goes on in the name of politics. Can I ask you about your approach to the media? Because th that's something that's really changed in your period in politics, even in my career. Um, you know, 20 years ago, it was routine for cabinet ministers to engage with the media and appear on programmes like Channel 4 News and Newsnight and the Today programme and pretty much anyone who would ask. These days, it's relatively rare. You're one of the last few big beasts who would engage with the media whenever asked. Well, we all did. Part of the job, I always thought. Uh, and I was a very controversial minister sometimes. I mean, the idea I was always some sort of very left-wing conservative, that wasn't how I was always perceived. And I got in the middle of some very big controversies. Uh, when I was at health, sometimes the Treasury. Um, and yeah, I mean, I wanted to go out there, take part in the debate, explain why I was doing what I was doing, answer my critics and, and uh, answer the, the criticisms. And I think you were expected, and uh, Thatcher, major governments, and uh, before that, uh, the, 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 the cabinet ministers had to combine some executive skills with the ability to go out and look out for themselves and argue their case and try to win the argument. Why has that changed? Do you think it's a uh, Well, the parties began to raise too much money and started paying millions on experts, largely from America, who said they knew how to win elections by using all kinds of modern techniques, including message discipline. Uh, so all this stuff that uh, you, 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 what you need is a simple message, a, a slogan, and you have to repeat it all the time because it won't sink in unless you repeat say. it. <laughs> uh, and you, you, you only you control uh, what all your ministers do so you only give interviews on subjects where the opinion polls show that you're popular, and you don't give interviews on subjects where you're unpopular, because that's the other side's subject, so don't feed the debate. And, and that you organize a grid, whereby ministers have to seek permission before they go out, get clearance for their speeches, learn the slogans, and then are permitted to go out and argue. I mean, it's farcical. Uh, that's why no political party can actually win an election now. I mean, one does win because it gets more than the others, but the campaigns on both sides are usually useless. It's worse than farcical, though, isn't it? It's very bad for democracy. It's one of the things that feeds the very considerable uh, uh, public cynicism about politics. I mean, the political class and the parties are almost despised as a class by the ma mass of the population, and it's because they, they inflict on the public these silly, repetitive slogans. Um, I never followed that. I mean, David Cameron had me back persuaded we come back, and I mean, I didn't have that much difficulty, I'm an addict. But I, 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 he promised me a couple of years, I did four. But I took no notice of any of this stuff. Uh, and I very much doubt whether Boris does, actually, either. But I just couldn't believe all this, and it was actually being applied. I knew that Blair had tried to do it. And, and, and so I even, though I wasn't as controversial, but I didn't, you know, just, went out and tried to defend myself and tried actually to advocate something positive, whatever I did so, on the media. And it's a much better way of proceeding and you'd win back public confidence, I think, in the debate. So your advice to your colleagues would be go back and engage. Get out there. I mean, yes. you say Boris doesn't. Boris I, Johnson... I wince when I hear on the radio some criticism of the minister, the government, supposed to be some dreadful thing, and then the presenter says, we asked for a minister to come on the programme, but no one was available. And that's because the apparatchiks have decided it's not that minister's day in the grid. And anyway, uh, there's no slogan to fit this particular thing, so no one is to go on and answer it. You said you came into politics because you thought you could make a difference. Yeah. Do you feel you have? I think I've been in governments where we undoubtedly did. I mean, the Britain is a transformed place, so it would have been anyway, of course. But I think, yeah, getting, getting I, mean, I think the Thatcher government and the major government which consolidated it, and the Blair government actually consolidated, which I wasn't in, consolidated it further. Uh, made, actually, it could have been. Made, made us to get in to you know, the modern globalised economy, free market economics, the rules-based order, all things I was talking about some time ago, um, that Britain could go back to being 
a leading second division power in the world, uh, uh, we had a, a role to play as, because we were going to be taken seriously as one of the big influential players inside the European Union. That gave us a foundation for our own relationship with the Americans. That's why we were so important to the Americans. We were the closest to them of these countries in this new power block, and we were taken seriously in other parts of the world as well. And the, the, the economic policy, business policy, our approach to earning our living in the world, all changed against a background of political and economic policy change by governments, all of which I think is very important. No, I mean, a politician is bound to say this at the end of his career, uh, but uh, yeah, I think we made a difference. It's countries, some of the, the movement of the country has been in the direction I would have wanted, and with colleagues, I hope I made a contribution to that. And now suddenly, it's all thrown into the air with this amazing, madhouse, childish debate about Brexit and where we're going now. But do you feel we're going over a cliff? Well, that just means that we will not be able to decide what we want to do. We won't negotiate anything, and we just crash out with no trade agreements with any country in the world, uh, no proper arrangements for our defence and security. A sovereign state, of course, but an extremely isolated one, because, unfortunately, uh, we are in danger of weakening our European alliance at the same time as the United States government is bringing to an end the Atlantic Alliance in the way in which we wish to. And a lot of dangers out there. China's the coming new power now. And President Putin has considerable ambitions on our doorstep in Europe. It's very funny talking to you because you talk about these almost apocalyptic scenarios and terrible things well, that happen I mean, in a very laid-back way. Not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, well, I, and partly, <laughs> I, but partly, partly in the end, it never normally happens. I mean, I mean, there is a real world. There is common sense. The, the vast majority of sensible people on both sides of the channel don't want what I'm describing. They know that no deal is ridiculous. Uh, and and they're, in their differing ways, working very hard to avoid it. And the Europeans know that the EU is going to be weakened by our departure. So they're not just trying to score points off us. They are trying to minimise the consequences as well. I mean, in the end, the, the real world, common sense, determine limits to just how crazy you can be, even in the world of politics. You, you said you would retire and then you changed your mind. Well, um, I, I thought I was going to retire in 2020 at the end of that parliament. Like everybody else, you know, I never imagined we have an election in 2017. So what I said was I had to decide, uh, do I retire three years earlier than I intended or could I contemplate making it two years later? And of course, being a political addict, I went for two years later. Well, do you want, do you want to stop? I mean... I don't want to stop. What I don't want to do is carry on for so long that even I realise I'm no longer capable of doing it. There's no point just going on and on and on uh, 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 until, you know, really it is getting embarrassing that you're still trying to do it. I don't think I'm anywhere near that stage at the moment, but this parliament could have several years to run. But whenever the election comes, no, I'm not going to stand again. And, and you, I mean, but I presume you don't imagine yourself as some sort of, you know, sitting at home listening to jazz... With a, with a cigar and a bottle of wine. Um, you'll you'll mind carry that. on. Well, I mean, it sounds quite nice in some ways, but, um, you, I mean, could you stop? I mean, my, my dad is 84 and he's a doctor and he can't stop and he carries on working. And he goes on to... practising, does he? Well, yes. I, I don't know. I, at the moment, my children rather nervously ask me, you know, what are you going to do, Dad? Where do you finally, finally give it up politics? And, uh, uh, and my best thoughts are, oh, I shall be able to see more cricket in the summer and all that sort of thing. I haven't got around to making any detailed plans, which is no doubt why my children will keep asking me these slightly nervous questions. I like to ask all, all the guests, um, what, what do you think is the most controversial or difficult to achieve way to change the world uh, that you back? Do you have... Do, do, do I have some startling... Uh... Innovation. Well, the one at the moment, because I, I think we've obviously got to spend more on the health service and social care because demand is rising at such a crazy rate. I mean, girls, people like me, we're all lasting longer, uh, and you have to adjust to that. I think that means we raise a lot of taxation. I mean, the, the country's broke. It, it's no good. It's, you say you print and borrow it, you know, here we come, Greece and Venezuela. Uh, that's just 
escapism. Uh, and so we are really, long last, going to have some serious budgets again, which you always used to have. This one's going to be a tax-raising budget. Uh, one of my things is, I think half the tax breaks that my generation got, which are election bribes, should not go to people like me in full-time work. This is a kind of prize for my age. I mean, poorer pensioners, that's fine. People on a higher rate tax, uh, I, they shouldn't get the winter fuel allowance to save me from fuel poverty. I should pay the same amount of tax as the other people I work with on the same salary. I should pay national insurance. Just finally, um, I had Jess Phillips on here a couple of weeks ago, and I, I, I put to her that a lot of us who cover politics look at the current generation of politicians and conclude that they're not the best we've ever encountered. I was wondering if you think that too. Well, of the newcomers, when I look at the, about half the House of Commons, uh, only entered in 2010 or later, there are some surprisingly good people. There are some outstandingly good people on both sides, I think, potentially. Um, I am reassured because we, with my aging cynicism about the nature of the political debate at the moment, uh, and, and actually all the risks they run of having you know, this constant attempt to find scandals and these scurrilous attacks on them and their families and everything else. Um, yeah, I, I always wonder, worry that we'll deter good, sensible people from coming into politics, but we haven't. Uh, still, I think the standard of the intake coming in is at least as high as it was in my day. I won't say too much about the standards at the top of the two parties, but both parties, I mean, I don't mean the leaders, but the, the general standard of the ones, you know, the, some of them, we, 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 eventually somebody will get a better cabinet and a better shadow cabinet together. But, but actually, new people anxious to get in, got themselves to the House of Commons, just as good as it was in my day, uh, and we've got to have, have some consensus emerge to just get back to a, a more grown-up, uh, sensible, uh, constructive type of political debate and a, a sensible system of government. Ken Clark, thank you very much indeed.